Okay, guys, in this video segment, we're going to uh, kind of do a real condensed version of the notes from today to help all those people who are gone. So uh, we ended up um, last time talking about um, enthalpy and being positive or negative and then entropy being positive or negative and how that deals with spontaneity. And then we went on to talk about Gibbs free energy. So this is not a new slide for us. It's something we've already covered. Um, and we said that this equation that you saw for the change in Gibbs free energy by comparing the change in enthalpy minus the temperature in kelvins times the change in entropy. Okay, So um, to solve for changes in Gibbs free energy, you need to have the delta H and the delta S. And then we had this practice problem to start. Uh, we're doing the production of iron 3 oxide from oxidation of metallic iron. We're given the enthalpy of the iron 3 oxide, and we're given all the entropies. Now, we're not given the enthalpies of the iron or the enthalpy of the oxygen because they're both zero, because they're in their standard states as elements or diatomics. So for enthalpy, these are zero. Now, that's not the case for your entropy values, okay? So if we start this problem, what we need to first do is we need to get a balanced chemical equation. So the very first step is write down iron, metallic iron, plus oxygen, making iron 3 oxide. Balance it a 4 to 3 to 2 ratio. And that's our step, our first step. Um, the next step is we want to solve for our entropy. Okay, so what is our change in entropy or delta S? We know our equation is the sum of your products minus the sum of your reactants. So our products here are our iron um, 3 oxide, and the entropy value for that is 90. So if we take 90 times 2, because there's two of them, that gives us 180 for our products. Subtract that from our reactants, which is going to be your oxygen times 3 and your iron times 4. Put those together, and we should get an answer like this. So if we look, here's the 90 for the iron 3 oxide times 2 moles of that. Here is your iron times 4 moles of that and your oxygen times 3 moles of that. And we end up getting a change in entropy of a negative 544 joules per Kelvin. Now notice that the mole value for entropy goes away because you had joules per mole Kelvin, per mole Kelvin, per mole Kelvin. But since we're taking this times 2 moles, times 4 moles, times 3 moles, that we're losing the mole label in our um, answer here. So we get a negative 544 joules, not kilojoules, just joules per Kelvin. Now the next step is finding the enthalpy change. Well, this one's pretty easy because we only have one value for enthalpy. Um, both the oxygen and the iron are zeros, so really our product, which is the negative 822.1, um, is our enthalpy change. But we have two of those. We had to make sure that we double that up. So here's your form equation. So your change in enthalpy is your negative 822.1 times 2, because there's two moles of that from our balanced chemical equation. The other two are zeros, so we get a negative 1644 kilojoules. Okay? So we have joules per Kelvin for entropy. We have kilojoules for enthalpy. And then, of course, we needed to finish up our equation, we need to change our temperature. So we have 25 degrees Celsius. We need to convert that to Kelvin, so we have 298 Kelvin. Okay? So now the last thing here is to take your delta S, your delta H, and your T, and just plug it into our equation for delta G. So our delta G is going to be our enthalpy minus the entropy times temperature. So here is our enthalpy, our delta H, minus temperature was 298 times our entropy. Notice in this one, I now have negative 0.544. Here is 544. So I've shifted this by 1,000 because I now need to have it in kilojoules because I want my, my, my um, labels to line up. So I have kilojoules here, I have kilojoules here, they line up. Calvin's here, Calvin's here, they cancel, and I end up with 1482 kilojoules. Okay? If you want additional practice with this, guys, uh, worksheet number two gives you some additional practice on a problem like this. Okay? So that's the, this problem. Now, the next thing that we did um, in our notes here is to talk about Gibbs free energy in terms of spontaneity and give it kind of a sign convention. So just like enthalpy and entropy, if you have a negative Gibbs free energy or you have a negative or releasing of energy, Anytime it's negative, it's spontaneous, okay? So in one of these scenarios, 
the plus minus scenario for enthalpy and entropy, it's always positive, which means it's always non-spontaneous. If you have a minus plus, it's always negative, so it's always spontaneous. However, we do have these scenarios where it's plus plus and minus minus, where Gibbs free energy, mathematically speaking, could come out to be a positive number or a negative number. In those cases, it really does depend on temperature, because temperature is one of those variables in our equation. So for the first scenario, when you have a plus plus, um, as you increase the temperature, okay, entropy has a bigger effect. So as temperature goes up, this kind of has a dominating effect on the process. Well, if you're dominating that effect and you're, and you're subtracting a, a positive, okay, the warmer it is, the more likely you are to make it a negative delta G. So that's going to actually help it get more spontaneous. If you have a minus minus, in this case, decreasing the temperature diminishes the effect of enthalpy and brings us to an entropy that might be more negative with negative G and makes our reaction more spontaneous. Okay, So this isn't like it can be either one. It is one or the other. It's either going to be plus or minus, and it depends on the numbers, the actual numerical values there. Okay, Make sure you have your head wrapped around this because one thing I really like to assess students on is their ability to kind of comprehend, okay, if I have this for enthalpy and this for entropy and this for Gibbs free energy, is it going to be spontaneous or not? What's going to happen there? Okay, so that's um, kind of a big piece of that. Now, the last part of this idea of spontaneity is we actually can calculate Gibbs free energy using standardized values. Okay, so we've seen this equation before. Your change in Gibbs free energy standardized is a Gibbs free energy of formation for the products and a Gibbs free energy of formation for the reactants. Um, so we're, here we can just pull these off of a table and we, again we can solve for our answer. So if we want to solve that, here's a practice problem you can do and then I'll give you the answer key in a second. So here's standard Gibbs free energy. Um, we're trying to solve for the change for a combustion of methane. Remember methane is CH4. And then, is it spontaneous or not? So um, go ahead and write out the equation for the combustion of methane. Make sure you balance it. And then look up your standardized Gibbs values off of the sheets on the web page or just do an online search for those things you need. And then solve it. Okay. So pause the video now if you don't want to see the, the actual answer key. Otherwise, I'm going to go over the key now. Okay. So here's your balanced chemical equation. Here is your delta G your products minus your reactants. So here are our products. So you have your 394.4 for carbon dioxide. You have your 237, which is your water, times 2, because there's two of them. You're going to subtract away the reactants. Okay, so methane is a negative 50.8. Oxygen is a 0 for our Gibbs free energy. Do the math on this, we get negative 18, 818 kilojoules. Okay. So if we have a negative value here, what that tells us is that we have a spontaneous reaction because all spontaneous reactions have negative free energy to them. All right. Again, additional practice on worksheet number two to help you do some more work with this, guys. Now, the last topic of the day we talked about was reaction mechanisms. Um, and basically saying that most, or not most, but several of the chemical type of reactions we deal with are not single reaction steps. They're actually multiple reactions in a row. Okay. When you, when you string multiple reactions in a row to accomplish something, you get what we call a mechanism. Okay? Uh, things to keep in mind with mechanisms. One, the slowest step is what determines the overall speed. So it's kind of like if you're getting ready in the morning, and the thing that takes you the longest to do is your hair. Well, that's going to be what determines how long it overall it takes for you to get ready in the morning, because that's going to slow everything else down if it takes you an hour to do your hair. Now, I don't have that problem, so... My slowest step is actually hitting the snooze button at home, and that's what kind of slows me down in the morning is hitting snooze two or three times uh, before my four-year-old comes in and jumps on me. Uh, activation energy is also a key thing for this idea of re reaction mechanisms, where the, whatever step has the highest activation energy determines how much energy you need to make it run because you're going to have multiple activations energies in here because you do multiple steps. So the highest one is the one that makes uh, kind of gives you the idea of how much energy total you need. Here's a way to graphically look at it. So you have your initial reactants, you have your final products, and these other two troughs are intermediate products. So what happens is you do one reaction step to get here, a second reaction to get here, and then a third reaction to get here. So this graph actually represents three different 
individual reactions as part of one mechanism. Okay, so you have three different activation energies. Now, if you take a look at the graph, um, these towers, these peaks are called activated complexes. That's where the reactant is turning into product. And then, of course, we have our products down at the troughs and our final product over here. Now, looking at the graph, if Y is free energy and we're running from left to right, you notice how A is actually lower than this last part over here. So because A is lower, that means you had to absorb energy or take energy in to get to here, okay? If energy's been going in, that means it's a positive value. So if energy goes in, it's positive. Positive means non-spontaneous. So from A across B, C, D, E, F, G, from A across to G, that's a non-spontaneous process. However, if we talk about the reverse of this, G going backwards to A, that would be your spontaneous direction, okay? Both of them had to climb an activation energy to start, but one of them, you had to constantly be feeding more energy to get it to end up over here versus the other one, okay? So last slide of the notes, um, this is kind of like a diagram of an organic mechanism. You can see where you start with one substance and go one, two, three, four, five, six different steps that you get to something you're trying to create. Now, you don't need to memorize this or even really know what's kind of going on in the chemistry here, but I just want to show it to you to show that there are um, mechanisms out there that are much bigger than just one or two steps, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten steps of chemistry happening to make something that you're looking for in there. All right, guys, that's a real quick overview of our uh, stuff from today. Um, that's it. Thanks.